There are tons and tons of ways to protect a lead in hockey. None of them are infallible, but most of them are pretty good when that lead is three goals. Good morning to you, I think. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Penguins. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates where you found this. Bruins 6, Penguins 5 in overtime does not at all reflect the scope of the catastrophe at hand considering the Penguins were up 5-2 to two at one point in that game and couldn't really do anything to prevent or even slow the Bruins from just continuing to come up ice and come up ice and come up ice. There were legitimately things to like about this evening from the Pittsburgh perspective. I'm not going to bury those because the outcome was so morbid. They did score five goals on a really good defensive team. They did take the play to the Bruins for two and a half periods, not just two periods, but two and a half periods. I thought the Penguins did a lot of really, really good things. And I brought this up with Sidney Crosby afterward. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of good things. Uh, a lot of good things. I mean, in every area, I think uh, we did some good things. I think that's why it's, it's disappointing to not come up with two points. But, you know, we've got to got to build off it and, you know, take that into to tomorrow. And you know, we got to turn the page back here. But that's the thing, too. You can't have the opponent just have free zone exits and uh, free passage through the neutral zone, free access across your own blue line. And Boston had that pretty much all night. There are two reasons for this. One is the one that nobody wants to hear, and that is that the Bruins are 9-1 and one for a reason. This team is solid. First line to fourth. You couldn't even tell the difference last night. You normally can. Don't misunderstand here. The Patrice Bergeron line and the David Pasternak line, they're 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 performing on some other level. But on this night, everybody had the free outsies and the free insies. And it went on as if as if there were just no resistance to be offered. And that's that. Okay, well, first, I get the first part out of the way. A reflection on the Bruins. Yes, they're very, very good. The second part of that is this team's not very hard to play against. It's just not. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by the good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across Western Pennsylvania. They, in turn, need your help. Find out how $1 can be turned into five full meals for those in need. Visit pittsburghfoodbank.org. According to Ron Hextall and Mike Sullivan, pretty much everybody associated with the Penguins, one of the things that they really set out to do this past offseason was to become harder to play against. In some To some degree, that's in the cliched, old-school Western Canadian sense, where they would just become a little bit more nails tough. And in the other sense, it was going to be that they would just be more effective in terms of the group attack, staying together, putting multiple sticks on a puck whenever there's a battle for it. The Penguins did that at times last night. But they didn't do it consistently, and they really didn't do it at all in the final 10 minutes. Again, give the Bruins credit. They were that good. But the Penguins were that not when it came to that time. And honestly, as I look up and down this roster, particularly the third and fourth lines and probably two of the three defense pairings, I ask myself, and did this during the game, Where and how was this addressed? By not moving Brock McGinn, by adding Josh Archibald, by adding Ryan Paling, 
uh, where, how, how are these players supposed to change things? And for that matter, what is the head coach doing to change things himself? The number one theme of the playoffs from last year, obviously, was the blown leads. Blown leads in Game 5, in Game 6, and then in Game 7. Two goal leads in Game 5 and 6. A third period lead in Game 7, not to pick the scab. But that looked to a degree like this. Yeah, Louis Domingue was Louis Domingue and, and whatever else. And when Tristan Jari got into the seventh game, he was playing on pretty much a broken foot. But the goaltending really wasn't all that great last night either. It certainly wasn't the culprit. There wasn't any single culprit. But what if, and this is something that those of you who've been listening to this show for a while might remember, and because I've brought this up over the, the summer months, what if the Penguins had a, a plan B, an alternate strategy when they get the lead? I'm not suggesting that they turn into the 1995 Devils or the 2000 Wild and just stand in the middle of the rink and wiggle their sticks, but maybe I am. Meaning, if that's what wins you the game, it's a three-goal lead. I asked Sullivan after the game if he's got one of those. You know, we got to defend better. We got to make better decisions with the puck. You know, you, you can play. We can we can play the type of game that sets us up for success, but we just have to manage the game better. And a lot of that is just your calculation of risk, making sure you stay above the puck, making sure you you know if. You don't have to manufacture things that aren't there, force teams to play goal line and goal line, things of that nature. And that that's just learning how to win. There aren't words to measure the respect that I have for this man and the professionalism that he displays with me every time we deal with each other. So I'm not in the business of asking him gotcha questions. I legitimately wanted to know if he has another attack plan, or in this case, a defend plan. And what you heard from him there in plain language was no. That answer was no. He believes in his system. He believes that his system covers all the bases. And you want to know something? He's right. With the right personnel at the right age. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Gene Padden, who asks simply, what do you think of Drew O'Connor last night, DK? And and my answer, Gene, is that he didn't play enough uh, when he was out there. I at first have something funny to share with you, uh, and I don't know if anybody else had this happen to them, but in watching O'Connor wearing number 10, being left-handed, having the visor, and kind of having his shoulders jut forward when he skates Oh, my God. Like, it was watching Ron Francis at times. Not comparing them. Not comparing them. Don't think I'm losing my mind here. But that was just something that I'm throwing in there. I I thought he, for the most part, stood tall and took care of business. He had the one giveaway early on that led directly to a Boston goal. And it 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 wasn't horrific. He made a semi-blind pass to a semi-not-in-a-great-position Jeff Petrie, and Petrie made a semi-lame attempt to poke it forward, and that's when it ended up on a Boston blade and ended up behind Jari. Otherwise, O'Connor was just fine. He was in on the forecheck. He was doing the things that you'd want him to do. I'm convinced he's not a center, but he was put into the position of being a center. And one of the many things that I thought went wrong for the Penguins last night, even before the ending, this is something that I was both thinking and talking about before the ending, was that Sullivan couldn't have anything remotely resembling matchups. He couldn't find a way to put like a Teddy Bluger on a Patrice Bergeron or another defensive forward. The Penguins don't have many of them on the Pasternak line, um, it's 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 not ideal. 
it wasn't ideal. But then you know what? As long as we're doing this before anyone thinks I'm excusing things for the Penguins because they also didn't have Chris Letang, who's out with an illness, and Jeff Carter. The Bruins played without David Krejci and Charlie McAvoy, and you saw their goaltender get apparently seriously hurt, Jeremy Swayman, later in the game. So they had their own issues to overcome. No excuses here. But O'Connor, 10 minutes and 40 seconds of ice time, uh, nothing significant statistically within that. He obviously had the minus one because of the turnover. And the bigger question that I'd have, no offense, Gene, is what did I think of Ricard Raquel only getting three more minutes than that? Did you know that? 1331 of ice time for Raquel. Didn't see him much at all in the third. Am I missing something, or is Raquel not this team's most dynamic forward right now? Just thought I'd throw that in there. You get a bonus answer, Gene. See how that works? You ask a question about O'Connor, and you get an O'Connor and a Raquel back. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm driving up to uh, Buffalo today. I'm going to cover this game tonight against the Sabres. That's a 7.38 p.m. faceoff, and I expect – the Penguins will be a better and more complete team. If that sounds naive, so be it. I'm not going to make an outcome prediction because I'm expecting Casey DeSmith to start, so I'm looking more in the direction of let's see them just continue to get better, but they've got to find a way to defend and then to sustain their defense once they do. I, I I I don't know. I just don't know right now. I appreciate the question, Gene. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one of these from Buffalo tomorrow. (laughs) 